get more confidence, get that promotion, get moving up the corporate ladder, get a better gig with an MBA from Mays Business School at Texas A&M University. Whether you're starting out or stepping up, now you can take your career to a whole new level with a full-time MBA in College Station and convenient weekend options at Houston City Center. Texas A&M has a program to suit your schedule. Visit mba.tamu.edu and Giga Maggie. Howdy, welcome to May's Mastercast. I'm Shannon Deer, the Assistant Dean for Graduate Programs, here with your groovy host, Ben Wiggins. Oh, groovy. That's a good one. I like that. Wow. <laughs> it seemed <laughs> fitting with having Shelly Sondheim on, so I felt like we needed to go with a musical adjective. Perfect. It's a groovy day in Aggie Land. It's a groovy day in Aggie Land. I love it. How are you? I'm doing all right. Doing yeah. all right. How are you? I'm well. Doing well. It's been a good day. Thought it was going to rain today. Yeah. They lied to us. Yeah, it kind of it was kind of like sprinkle, sprinkle, like the entire day. Yeah, I can't even tell if it's sprinkling, but I guess that's yeah, what's it was happening. like the, it's not even a sprinkle. Yeah. Was, yeah, like but but like little bitty 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 drops. Okay, little bitty. Well, on today's show, I think we have our coolest guest yet. Is that fair to say? I mean, we've had yeah, some cool guests, so. so I'm not insulting anyone. Dean Jones is pretty. Shannon's cool. Shannon's insulting everyone. Yeah, except Shelly. No, Shelly's pretty cool. And I think musicians are cool anyway, so he gets a couple of bonus points for that. No question. Today on the show, we have Shelly Sondheim. He is a global music industry professional and the CEO of CSM Words and Music. His company is engaged in the development of competitive materials and artists in pop, R&B, rock, and dance. Shell is also a guitarist. I would say first, maybe, um, but he's a guitarist first. And he's a pop songwriter, music producer, lyricist, vocal arranger, studio session specialist, electronic dance remixer, industry network expert, and industrial music business entrepreneur. And a partridge in a pear tree. I think so. I mean, it's so much stuff. It's funny because one of the things that Shell talks about is creating success in your own lane. But And I know he has a lane, but it sounds like a lot of lanes <laughs> when, you yeah. read, when you read that out. Shell's recording and performing credits include Phil Collins, Natalie Cole, Little Richard, Wayne Newton, as well as extensive worldwide TV and film credits. Just a little shout out to my dad. He's played for some of those folks, too. So um, maybe that's why I like musicians so much is because I just really like my dad. But anyway... Shelly also runs a comprehensive masterclass training and mentoring program custom tailored for universities, colleges, junior and senior high schools, youth camps, festival panels, and music industry organizations. He has lived all over the country over the course of his education and career. Shelly also graduated from Berklee College of Music in Boston, which is a world-renowned college of music. So welcome Shelly to the show. We are so excited for his interview. So excited. It is our pleasure and my pleasure to welcome Shelly Sondheim to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me and for the time that we put in preparing. I know we're going to have a very robust dialogue and thank you so much for including me. Every time you speak, I feel better. I feel I feel positive. I feel uplifted. I love I love listening to your voice and I love the words that you say. So this conversation will be a treat. Thank you so much. By the way, uh, Shelley, I, I listened to almost all of the discussion with Richard and I heard you mention Keith Ferrazzi, um, who wrote one of my favorite business books, Never Eat Alone. And uh, yeah, so he is he's kind of a, a little bit of a business hero of mine. I was very happy. Happy to hear that. And I think a, a personal hero and professional hero to many. I mean, he's really helped a lot of people. His story is great, and his encouragement is always great. He's such a positive, uh, generous guy. I, too, was fascinated by that book, and that's what initially led me to Keith Ferrazzi, and then going on to his site, Greenlight, and his follow-up book, of course, his network and his tribe. It's very... Uh, Reminded me of 12-step work, you know, or, you know, this, this sort of uh, care, accountability. But uh, he has uh, uh, tremendous insights and, and positivity, and I, I really respect him. And 
You know, I, I've, I've learned a lot from Kate Ferrazzi. Let's let's get right into it. What is your favorite superpower? And you, I, I, you, you, you gave me some foreshadowing on this, but I do want to hear the answer that you gave again. I have to say honestly, uh, no ego matter. I don't have a superpower. I think that that superpower resides within all of us. Everybody is their own superpower. And I know there are, we're going to talk about mentors, we're going to talk about teachers, we're going to talk about inspirations. That's not, when, we, when I hear, what is your favorite superpower, somehow there's, a, there's a, just a little bit of an avenue to take it away from, well, the superpower is right here. Mm. And so I have to say that my favorite superpower is Shelley Sondheim. Yes. Let me, let me follow up on that a little bit. What do you think is the most unique? Because I, I listen to you speak and I kind of watch the way that you carry yourself, your posture. There's something very unique about what makes you you. And I, I wonder often, uh, because I've heard you speak several times in the last uh, in the last week or so, I wonder often what is the thing that is most unique about you as a person. And I have some thoughts on what the answer could be, but you've known you a lot longer than I've known you. So, what are what are your thoughts on that? Well, I believe that for quite some time. I mean, and this isn't in the spiritual realm, and everybody has their religion, everybody has their philosophy. Sure. I'm a Buddhist. Okay. I was introduced to Buddhism very young, in junior high school. Never really took, got reintroduced in high school, got reintroduced in college. Yeah. Only at some point, I decided that I was going to really dig into this a little bit. And start yeah. To- and uh, I'm now 39 years into my practice. Yes. Morning and evening. Okay. If there's a shining light coming through my life, I truly would like to feel that it's emanating from that connection with the universal law of cause and effect, the rhythm of of the universe, which I believe in, through my practice of uh, Nichiren Daishonin Buddhism, or chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. There are many friends that do this. There are many musicians that do this. I've been inspired by people that do it. I've been part of an organization called the SGI. And so this is fundamentally where I'm coming from. And then we get into the skills and the tasks and the career and the, you know, the music. And I know we're going to talk about these things. And, but but the, that's, the, that's the spark that I hope that you see and feel and that everybody sees and feels when, we, when I encounter people. Yes, there there is there is a unique magic to you, and and I I love hearing about where that comes from. What does the process of your practice look like over the course of a day, maybe over the course of a week? Uh, it's getting up as early as possible, starting okay. the day, the sun, or maybe uh, waiting for the sun to come up. So starting an early day, yeah, a full day chanting for as you know as long as. I can. Sometimes it's a you know quick three five minute practice because I'm you know, dashing out with other tasks. Other times I'll sit and practice and chat for an hour or two hours and really concentrate on the, you know the things that are important to me. Okay. I do the same thing in the evening. So it's morning and evening, and I've coupled that with exercise and yoga and med- other meditation and other inspirations that I gain through. Uh, Informations that my wife Victoria shares with me, that my friends share with me. Uh, I'm part of an organization called the SGI, Soka Gakkai International, which is throughout 190 countries. And so we have the publications that I'm reading, you know, the World Japan, Living Buddhism. So the, the practice is really starting out just like the sun rises and the moon rises, you know, starting out with fusing my life with the rhythm of cause and effect and launching from that point into a full day and then kind of returning back to report to my life how that day was and appreciation and gratitude and uh you know expectation that i can do the same thing the next day beautiful we've we've talked briefly on the show about how westerners especially often have a 
an appreciation for Kronos, the time of the clock, but not as much of an appreciation for Kairos, um, you know, which is a little bit more. It's the dictionary defines Kairos as a, a propitious moment for decision or action, but it's a it's a word from Greek, and I guess it, it's a it's an ancient Greek word meaning the right, critical, or opportune moment, and it's not necessarily defined by the clock. And I think as in the United States, I think sometimes we lose track of concepts like that and sort of listening to our bodies and listening to our minds and, you know, uh, letting letting the universe tell us what the right timing for things is. That's but, very well said, Dan, and it's very, very much how I feel. You know, when I'm inspired by somebody like the great late Kobe Bryant talk about meditation or you know, we've mentioned Keith Ferrazzi, uh, you know, we, there's all kinds of Deepak Chopra. I mean, we can just really go down the list of different kinds of inspirations that all return to meditation and, you know, uh, discovering the, the inner rhythm and, the, and, 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 and paying attention to that uh, inner voice, let's say. So the beauty for me, why this Buddhism clicked for me, I'm a very analytical guy, I'm a very manipulative guy, a thought guy, and I figure it all out upstairs here. And it doesn't always work out the way that the brain is, is making me think that it's supposed to. So with my practice, I'm able to really fuse directly into the depth of my life. The depth of my life, fuse my life with the rhythm of the universe, cause and effect. And then my life shows me what's going to happen for the day. Yeah. The brain dictating what should happen, what didn't happen. Well, since that didn't happen, now I can be mad at people or slander them or feel ugly about myself or whatever. The, the confidence gained through fusing my life with the rhythm of cause and effect really has uh, helped me so much. Not that I don't think, not that I don't plan, but I just... I trust in the rhythm of the universe and I trust that my life is fused with it through it's, it. It's the best way to live that, that leads to, to gratitude, to happiness. Um, that's, and no complaints. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not, not a, not a stage to complain. <laughs> Indeed. Where did you grow up? Uh, fundamentally moved a lot throughout the United States. I can say I grew up in Los Angeles. So there was okay. junior high school and high school in Pacific Palisades. Yeah. Uh, on to college in San Francisco, on to college in Boston, living in Vegas, back to LA. My father was a uh, very successful television executive and his job uh, allowed us and forced us to move all the time. So we, we, we lived in a lot of places. I had to learn how to make friends. Hmm. The, the life of a television executive is a very interesting one. I have never done that job, but I've been in meetings next to them uh, quite a few times. And the way I love the way television executives think, uh, their minds are fascinating. Yeah, my dad's a pretty fascinating guy. He was very successful at what he did. He's, of course, retired now, and he's uh, you know, living a beautiful life in Palm Desert. But uh, through his work, we, he, he escalated his career often. And that usually meant moving to another city and moving to another TV station, and turning around that market and so on and so forth. Yeah. How, how many in your family did you say? I have one older brother. Okay. What was your what was your greatest challenge as a child? You mentioned moving around, and sometimes that that ends up being the thing for people who moved around a lot. But was there something else? Uh, not really. I think that that was uh, one of the fundamental skill sets that started my ability to do the networking, and build a community, and have the tribe, and start a band, and you know have a gang, and be in a group, and you know you you learn how to talk to talk with people and how to reach people and how to get along with people and how to make friends. I would say the singular one that sticks out in my mind is just the ability to adapt in a new environment. You go from Fresno to Pacific Palisades, you go to Lebanon, Pennsylvania to Tacoma, Washington. You know, it's to, to learn how to, to do that. Do you still have close friendships with anyone that you knew growing up or or is that was that just not something that uh, that ended up being a feature of your later life? I I'm, I wonder about this because you were because you bounced around so much. 
I, I would say that the glue really sticks. I mean, friends in every spot. Yeah. Ongoing relationships, things like you you were on the call with uh, uh, Richard last week when we yeah. did the MBA students and you we were talking to with my friend Wilfredo Reyes, who I met, you know, 40 years ago coming out of college. Terry Woman, who I met going into Boston school. So I, I make it a point to really continue the communications with people. And so by doing that, I've been able to continue on with relationships that matter and have mattered for many, many years. It's it's so interesting the the value. So Malcolm Gladwell talks, and this is not this is not quite what you're talking about. But Malcolm Gladwell talks about weak ties. In I believe it's in the Tipping Point, um, and what he's talking about is the value of relationships that are not super close friendships in facilitating connecting people to each other. Um, but what where where that kind of resonated for me as I was listening to you talk is in the idea of it doesn't take big gestures to maintain a friendship for a really long time. It takes little gestures consistently. I, or at least that's been my experience. And as you said, you seem to be a person who is willing to do the work of maintaining a relationship over a really long period. What, what's, what, what have you learned about that process? Well, I, I think that you said that having the uh, consciousness, having the awareness, having the sensitivity of making those little moves or larger moves, you know, depending on, on, on what it is. Right. Uh, sincerity is a tremendous card to play throughout life. And yeah. to sincerely reach to somebody that you haven't spoken to, particularly in a time like now that everybody's a little bit uncertain. Sure. You know, I've reached out to so many people during this time, but it's my normal thing. I mean, I, I'm talking to Austria and Berlin and Sweden, Kazakhstan and San Diego and, you know, Memphis all throughout the day. I'm reaching people all throughout the day and they're reaching me. So I, I, th I think that being awake, being grateful for the opportunity to have such friendships or to maintain such relationships, you know, uh, is, the, is, the, is the glue. And it does take effort. It doesn't just happen if you just sit on hands and kind of expect everybody to reach you. I've never been that kind of person. I've always been somebody that's wanted to reach somebody. Even if they're not interested in me reaching them, I had to deal with that as well, you know, where not so much rejection, but just it's that gentle push that happens. It's certainly in the life of a musician, a music professional, a music producer. It's like nudging enough so that you're, you're still accepted, but, you know, call it pushy, call it a little nudgy, but uh, people, I think, can count on me being there for them. You mentioned Kazakhstan a moment ago, and that came up in conjunction with you and uh, Richard Castleberry's discussion of the youth music experience when you two spoke last week. Tell us a little bit more about the youth music experience. Well, I'd like to speak uh, quite a bit about the youth music experience. It's a fantastic uh, initiative that I've created and curated. Uh, I'd like to kick it back a little bit how I even got to the country of Kazakhstan. Oh, please. The niche. Uh, I was very fortunate to get involved with uh, an artist. Oh, wow. Uh, their, their national pop star was in the middle there. Okay. And her name is Anna Scheider from the niche. And her husband and backer and you know supporter, George Barman. So this okay. is in front of uh, one of the pieces. I traveled to Kazakhstan to work on sessions. We took her to Phil Collins' studio in Geneva, did recordings there, took her to Berlin, had her meet the president and vice president of Universal Music. Uh, let's take another look at uh, Anish with uh, AKG. And uh, through my own network, I was able to not only bring in all the writer, producers, and whatnot, but uh, in terms of business sponsorship, we had her uh, subsidized and, and supported by AKG Microphones, and they're very, very selective about that short list of people that they do this with. Yeah. So we, you know, they, she did a, a, a big opening concert and had all the, all the mics and all the, you know, 
headphones and all of the, the tech stuff like you're wearing now and, and using now, uh, sponsored by AKG. So it was through, through this association that I got to know about many artists in Eastern Europe, Kazakhstan, and as I say, being on television there, and being in the talent competition there, and being the judge of their new wave stars, so to speak, and then being hired by that man, and that, that artist, to develop her international career. So it was through this work that I did for a few years that I encountered Richard. And uh, Richard was doing his tremendous work for the President's University and doing his MBA, you know, growing the program. And fast forward to today, uh, I've put together a program called the Youth Music Experience, which uh, is a an award, it's an award program, it's, and it's something that is a creative mentoring program for deserving youth in an existing region. And it involves several, uh, as I talk about awards, the silver, the gold, the platinum, and the Zero to Hero Incubator uh, series, grand prize. So it involves going to meet them, South France for this industry, education industry, uh, immersion week. It includes going to Sweden to a facility and a group of folks that we're uh, closely linked to in Sweden. It includes an award going to the Berkeley College of Music for some program. It includes going to the Reeperbahn Festival in Germany and then doing live sessions and showcases and uh, you know this sort of master recording and master video. So I've been working very hard to promote this program as each of those things I've accomplished, I've, I've succeeded at. I've bundled this all into one 10 month, five region program. And so my challenge has been to find the right region, the right territory, the right client, who A, will fund this as it's a premium program, and B, who really needs it and wants it and deserves it. So as I shared in the call last week, I get close and it goes away. Get close and it goes away. And I speak to Malaysia, Trinidad, Tobago, Oman, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Kazakhstan. You know, there, there's plenty of money in places. The question is really finding the right client that sees these values and in a philanthropic way wants to really support the idea of building and sustaining careers in today's global music industry with a bunch of career experts around them doing it. That, in a nutshell, is what the youth music experience is. Yes, well, there is there is no one better suited to to bring that to successful funding and to push it to future success than you, I'm sure. Um, that that what you were just saying it reminded me of something else that you said last week in describing the the platform success in your own lane the you know that kind of theme i would say of perhaps of your entire professional life um can you tell our audience a little bit more about what that phrase and that platform means to you certainly uh that was our discussion last week with the master class uh mba students uh and the topic was creating success in your own lane and i shared the story that this idea, this theme, this mantra, as you might have it, was uh, shared to me by a very prominent uh, music attorney mm-hmm. in South of France, Carlton Hotel, during one of the meetings, saying to me, you know, Shelley, you're like your own guy. You're creating success in your own lane. Uh, so that's what we need to focus on, and, you know, in terms of uh, introductions to the music industry and making, making other connections. And that really resonated with me. So much so that I was engaged and hired to do my artist in residence uh, program at Columbia College Chicago, twice actually, 2010 and 2012. I took that theme, Creating Success in Your Own Lane, to the student body there, uh, their music business management de- department, their music department, and their audio recording department, which was several thousand young people. And so I realized that the values that I talk about, creating success in your own lane, are really fundamental to all disciplines and all careers and all all folks really because what it really comes down to is not emulating others it's not comparing to oneself to others it's really having your own identity and your own self 
confidence and your own sense of worth while creating your own success, whether you're an accountant or an attorney or in the medical field or engineer, whatever it could possibly be, it's particularly true in the music industry, you have to have enormous confidence as to who you are and what you're doing. And I realized, you know, I, I made the joke uh, again with Richard that how many times can you hear no on Sunset Boulevard? Yeah. Uh, there are all kinds of possibilities all around the world. And we, he was comparing me to the idea of, you know, didn't become David Foster or didn't become Quincy Jones or didn't become Trevor Horn or, you know, Jamin Lewis or whatnot. I'm Shelley Sondheim. And I found that, you know, by reaching out and sharing my values, my network, my professional worth, my expertise, and my passion to want to work together and connect together and make a connection. But there were clients in Belgium and in Austria and in Germany and Sweden and in the Caribbean. And so that is how I built a very substantial international clientele, seeking my services and seeking the services of people that I bring into work. Well, whatever it is that got you to the place where you are now, I, I think many people would be quite envious of a life that has led to this place. And, uh, and so you're to be commended for all of the things that you've done to bring you here. Thank you so much, Ben. I mean, I also shared a, a bit of a story. Let's take a look at B.B. King. Uh, this was a story coming out of college. Yeah. Uh, Trying to, you know, like many of the people that might be even listening to the master cast that you're producing, students or young, young, young people in college, you know, there's a big question about getting a gig and getting work, and yeah. you know, where does the education? So, graduating from Berkeley College of Music after four years, had a hotshot jazz fusion band, did tremendous amount of stuff in Boston and New York. And we were, the, we were at the top of the heap. So I moved to Las Vegas, where my mom lived. I take my guitar, go to the very top of the strip, the t- Tropicana, and sit in, in all the lounges to try and get work. One of the things that we also did was jam at the Musicians' Union, noon, one o'clock. So that whatever celebrity, Bette Midler or Tom Jones, or you know, it could be Frank Sinatra or Sammy Davis at that point, they would come to the Musicians' Union with their music director or conductor to hear the new arrangement or chart to have it kind of work out. So I was there religiously every day, you know, at, at noon, one o'clock for the, for the afternoon jam. No car, carrying my amp, carrying my guitar on the bus, 105 Vegas degrees, right? And I get to the union, I set up my stuff. And so this particular day, in comes B.B. King. B.B. King. Uh, yeah, the man. My, my, and I know you can relate to this because of Texas and the blues and whatnot. So my natural reaction is to, you know, start to get up out of my chair. And yeah, it's B.B. King. You, you play, you play. I'm like, oh, I play, oh, okay. So we put the chart and we read the chart and it says solo and I play the B.B. King. Do, 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 do. Yes. Mm-hmm. Gives me the thumbs up. So when it's over with, I mean, I'm just so out of my mind that I just did this in front of with B.B. King sitting right in front of me. I said, you know, Mr. King, I have your classic Cook County Jail record would you consider signing it for me? Uh, I have to go back to my apartment and get it. He goes, yeah, go ahead, I'll, 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 do, I'll do that. So now remember, I don't have a car. So I gotta leave the union, wait for the bus, bus. Yeah. go to the apartment, grab the record, wait for the bus again, come back. And when I get back to the union, nobody's there except B.B. King and his music director. So I give him the record and he signs it for me. And he talks with me and he says, Sheldon, Stay with it, B.B. King. Love it. I, my uh, reaction I have this record, uh, you know, by my music stand and know that there's uh, that encouragement. So I, I relate that story to the similar types of values that we're promoting and uh, uh, offering through the Youth Music Expo and through Create Success in Your Own Lane is that it was just that, that bit of encouragement to stay with it. You know, it, it was an all-time great taking its time to encourage me. And a very, I, I had no gig. I had just gotten out of college. I'm trying my best on everything I can possibly think. And I have B.B. King say to me, stay with it, which was monumental for me, obviously, because I'm still staying with it. <laughs> no, yes, yes, very much so. And 
it's it seems like you you said to me on the phone last week not everyone's going to be jay-z not everyone's going to be taylor swift not everyone's going to be bb king and the idea of of making sure that we keep distance between our self-worth and the followership not that you don't engage with the people who like your work that that is obviously very important but it is it is insidious the way that that and basing our self-concept around how many people hit the like button is can that that can kind of seep into things so easily and it seems like it seems like you do an excellent job teaching people to maintain that distance um well thank you it's it's an idea of really uh uncovering there is a there is a lady gaga and there is a beyonce and there's a maroon five but be beyond that celebrity or that celebrity group mm -hmm. there are 300 jobs 400 jobs there are, there are lots of roles that are being played labels lawyers managers publishers tv sync you know, engineers, musicians, music directors, copiers, right? There's so many ways to be involved at the highest levels of contribution and have a career and earn a living, you know, when you find success in your own lane. And so again, these are the kind of values and the kind of uh, substance that I and a large group of colleagues in my network uh, seek to uh, portray and seek to uh, share with those that we uh, involve in the music experience. As president and CEO of CSM Words and Music, how does your how does your creative side influence how you act and operate as a business owner? How do those two things play together? Is there ever any difficulty there? I wouldn't say that there's any difficulty except the difficulties that come in business. Uh, you know, there are people, and this is, I think, a little while ago, not so much today, but there still are people who are really solely the creatives and uh, you know, aren't, aren't over the accounting and aren't over the marketing and aren't over the le legal documents and aren't over the you know, networking, let's say, or the trade events or this sort of stuff. And their role is, is, is creative. Uh, there are people who are just involved in the business. Mm -hmm. and all of those things, the trade shows and whatnot. I've always been kind of a 200% guy. I've had my hand fully involved in the sessions and the jamming and the guitar and the musicians and the hanging out with all of the music stuff and creating music, writing music, producing music, transcribing music, listening to music, just the full creative side. But I've always been the guy in the group that was doing the business, that was selling, that was promoting, that was putting the band together, that was making sure everybody knew that we were gigging on Friday night at eight o'clock, that was doing the, you know, all the design work. And, and when I say I'm the guy, what I really mean is I'm the guy that found the teams and the colleagues and the people who were interested in doing those kinds of things. They weren't necessarily gonna be, uh, you know, a, a badass drummer or a funky bass player or a great sax solo player, a great lead singer or an arranger, but they were going to do, they were gonna take care of social media. They're gonna take care of marketing. They're gonna take care of the club attendance or they're gonna take care of the travel. They're gonna take care of, you know, the instrument rental. There's so many tasks. So. I'm very good in both 200%, in my 200%, both hundreds, to assemble the right teams. I guess that would be executive producer role. And I believe that I grew into that role as a, as a primary. Hmm. Question about that. Since so much of your so much of what you do seems to be bound up in communicating with others and, and uh, developing business relationships, that sort of thing. I'm, I'm much the same way. The, the other side of that coin, something that I struggle with as a business person and kind of as a person is when I'm 
forced to kind of sail on open water by myself. I often have, and, and I don't have something to anchor to. If I, if I just have to generate the destination myself and say, all right, I'm inspired to go here. Sometimes I have trouble with that. Do you ever, what, what are situations, because you seem like a person who's not rat, rattled by much of anything. What, what is your, what, what positions in what situations do you feel uncomfortable as a business person? I mean, I think where I've felt uncom- discomfort. Mm-hmm. But I don't think I feel uncomfortable. I, I, oh, okay. I don't know if that's like too magnanimous or egotistical to say. No, I don't but think so. Where I've experienced discomfort is in having the passion and the enthusiasm and the wantingness try something new to get involved in something else yeah i don't want to say miserably fail it but just not succeed at it case in point we were talking about side hustles in last week's conversation with one of the deans uh literature and there was a moment that i was very fascinated and got involved with companies and with a private company with automated banking solutions currency exchange machines old coins machines this sort of thing yeah i'm from a banking family i don't have that that sort of uh, pedigree i don't have that sort of uh, mindset but i do have a salesman's mindset and yeah. i was able to discuss these uh, foreign currency exchange machines with a hilton corporation and a country of Oman to a you know, prominent family there and so and with manufacturers one was Hess in Germany, one was Rosengrenz in Sweden. So I had it in my mind that I was going to succeed magnificently with all kinds of currency exchange machines at Disneyland, resort <laughs> hotels and various airports and roll coin machines in the malls. And, you know, this was my grand plan for me to be a, a gazillionaire. <laughs> and I was at it for, you know, about a year, year and a half, trade shows, all of that, hitting it really hard. And I don't want to say I failed miserably, but I, I, I failed at providing that service. Mm. The primary reason, if there is one, is that there are bigger people like Diebold, Fujitsu, others, N- N- NCR, that make the ATM machines, and it's their business. When machines break, how, to, how they fix, you know, front, their frontline workers. I didn't have any of that in place. So the larger players liked my idea and liked my contacts and took them from me. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and, and I had to really uh, tail between the legs, a little money spent, a lot of effort, tremendous amount of effort. Yeah. Something that was just not for me. Hmm. So, uh, you know, as it unfolded, or it dissipated, started to implode, whatever the words you want to use, I found discomfort in that, hey, I thought I could, but it was the, the, the train that didn't run. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's probably not the most fun story to tell. We, we appreciate you. Uh, we appreciate your forthrightness. I, I think the, the, the fun part of that story is that I tried. Yeah. I tried that I made contacts in and was using my skill set to get along with corporate leaders and uh, corporations and manufacturers in an area that I really, I mean, if it was Fender, Gibson, Roland, you know, I, I could easily hang Yamaha, you know, that, that's, that's been my world, but uh, Deodario Strings, Ernie Ball, whatever, Wawa, I, 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 could, I, could, I could stay there forever, but I was able to create a new network of business associates, business colleagues, but I really wasn't cut out for that, that line of work. But you made friends, you learned a lot, and you've got all of that in your back pocket. <laughs> you've mentioned Sweden a few times, and you were uh, recently appointed an international advisor to Sweden. How did that come about? Well, it's a very fantastic story. You know, I have a, uh, I've developed artists in Sweden, but there was a tremendous uh, opportunity with a woman friend colleague, Asa Naiman, hmm. from an area called Fallen Borlangi uh, Darlana. It's in the northern part of Sweden. 
brought me an artist who had developed some songs. The artist went to do other things in her life, but Asa was so very keen on wanting to continue to work with me and my wife, Victoria, and our company. And so I started to involve her as my intern and an executive assistant, taking her to all of the international trade shows, meet them in the south of France, Popcom in, in Germany, South by Southwest, the news expos, the, you know, the, these sorts of things, introducing her to my entire network. And what she had, the uh, tremendous fortune, is to go back into her small community where there was a very prominent festival called the Peace and Love Festival. It's kind of like Scandinavia's Woodstock. 40,000 people capping out for a week. And, you know, headliners Jay-Z and Beyonce and who we're talking about, Skrillex and, you know, Aerosmith and just all the headliners and all the Euro acts as well. Right. Well, Asa, in her brilliance, was able to gain venture capital investors and funding through the EU and whatnot and through her community to launch something called the Trigger Creative Conference and to build a facility called the Boomtown Educational Facility. And so she used this opportunity to invite me to come in as an international advisor for not only the Peace and Love Festival that was existing in their town, but for the Trigger Conference and to become part of growing this boom town. Mm. So it was really fantastic. Uh, It went on for five years. I was directly involved in it for three of those five years. Funding ran out, Peace and Love Festival, ended uh it was too expensive to run so the project came to an end but during that time i was very fortunate to know a fellow who is sort of the godfather to victoria queen victoria uh and they have something called victoria Dagen, which is the day of victoria's birth okay special event on this this island in sweden and i was invited to come meet the king and queen I sit with them in their, you know, uh, box, so to speak, for an outdoor concert. And uh, I think I should supply some of those photos to you. I don't know that I have those up, but um, we can get those for you. So this international advisor to Sweden, I was able to bring my entire network of contacts and put them into Asa's lap. So you know, she had people like Seymour Stein and Richard Gauthier and the, the Orchard and all kinds of uh, music industry players come to Sweden for the seminars and for the panels. And there's some stuff on YouTube about, you know, Shelly Sama and Peace and Love Festival, Sweden, Trigger, Boomtown, and some videos that are already posted. So that, that, that's how that happened. I, I, I connected with Sweden in a very meaningful way from the very first trade show I went to in the year 2000 in the south of France. Somehow I felt like I was part of them. They were, you know, a lot of writer-producer teams, Max Martin and, you know, uh, Anders Bag, and they're very collaborative and they pop song and they had all the technology and it's writer-producer teams. That really worked for me. And I was welcomed into that Sweden crowd. So having the, the affiliation with ASA together as my, as my executive assistant, uh, having a presence at this trade shows is kind of like a, the American Swede, you know, is, is always in the booth, so to speak. And uh, having this opportunity with the Peace and Love Festival and Trigger and Boomtown was really a terrific experience. And my connections still run so very deep to this day. In the youth music experience, Asa is named the program director. Uh, if, if I had to describe Swedish people using one adjective i think it would be for the ones that i've met i think it would be sincere going back to a word you used uh you said sincerity earlier and I, the swedish people seem very sincere to me i think sincere is a perfect word polite is another word yes i also want to really not diminish the intensity of yeah. the niceness swedish people are very together very yeah. clever me at the bottom of this uh, media press with me sitting with the king and queen. You yeah. see at the very top, you'll see the Boomtown facility. And so that's a, that's a little bit of uh, the promotion. We'll get you some more as well. Yes. Uh, last, uh, last couple of questions, and then we'll move on to a few rapid fire to close out. Uh, your yeah. masterclass training and mentoring program, Sondheim Artist in Residence, uh, 
share a little bit about the history there? Um, what got you interested in this brand? Well, one of the things that was very successful for me in doing these mentorships at, at the Trigger Area event, and I've done it for Berkeley since I've graduated, been one of their original Berkeley alumni representatives. Right. Uh, Columbia College Chicago was a big one for me because my friend and mentor, Lee Burke, the retired president of Berkeley College of Music, uh, was so instrumental in helping me to gain this opportunity. Uh, introduced me to all the right people, and so I got the gig. And so I went to Lee to say, how do you think I could best impact this week's stay? And, what, and his, his, his recommendation to me was, bring a professional army with you. So what we did is we reached into the Chicago community and found folks from music dealers and uh, Vince Lawrence from Slang Music and some of the house producers and some of the jingle producers and some of the uh, very active musicians and uh, business people that were working in the music industry in Chicago. And I brought them in as guest artists and interviewed them in the sort of a way that you're doing with me. I did with them 10 questions from Guy Osiris' book, which was a very insightful a music industry icon. And so this uh, song and artist in residence became not just me. It was me and uh, an army of professionals that I brought in. And they offered internships to these students. And the perspectives of what I had to offer were magnified and amplified by the many professionals that came in and, you know, had their story and their take on what it is to have a career in the music industry. And so, you know, it was, it was, it was so successful that I was invited back. I didn't realize that they had artists in residence kind of once and then they looked for somebody else. Right. It was actually the second time, which was really a, a privilege. And with that, Columbia College came in relationships with the president, Warwick Carter, who's passed away now. One of Warwick's goals before uh, he left Columbia College, Chicago, was to have Herbie Hancock receive an honorary doctorate. Oh. And he worked for three years behind the scenes uh, to, to organize Herbie Hancock receiving his honorary doctorate from Laura Carter, who's in the striped jacket. It's my friend, right. Ringo Shikam, who is the vice president of International Committee of Artists for Peace. It's our organization that Herbie Hancock leads, along with Wayne Shorter and Carlos Santana, yeah. and board of advisor members. And so uh, this, this relationship with Columbia College Chicago and its students and its faculty just grew into, you know, miraculous branches. I'm so very grateful for it. That's amazing. Let's uh, let's move to let's move to rapid fire. What have you recently tried to teach yourself? Well, it's interesting. I've come so full circle with so many different kinds of accomplishments. Uh, starting on the guitar, moving into arranging, moving into the technology of you know digital audio work workstations, moving into songwriting, moving into lyric writing, vocal yeah. producing, dance remixing industry trade event marketing global networking career mentorship that's a lot of hats to wear sure we got a little bit neglected or a lot neglected if i can be so dead honest it's guitar practicing so i'm now coming back to guitar where it really all started scales chords studying the berkeley book studying transcribing songs getting into a rhythm of regular guitar practice because I hadn't done that. So that's what I'm returning to. I want those skills to be really sizzling. And so that's what I'm facing now that, you know, 40 years into a career, I kind of forgot my best friend who I started with. So I'm returning to that best friend and restringing the guitars and practicing scales. I, and I know you're putting your money where your mouth is because you said after your conversation with Richard last week that you were you needed to go back and practice some of those as soon as the conversation was over. Yep, absolutely. If you could have anyone, you've had many mentors, but if you could have anyone as a mentor for one day, who would it be? Oh, I'd probably say my wife. Oh, love that answer. Yeah, my wife, Victoria. Just tremendous amount of love, compassion, and wantingness for me to succeed, but a lot of wisdom. 
that he also has a tremendous amount of professional experience and personal experience. Um, traveled around the world with me, so you know, she has a lot of insights as to how to better myself. So I would choose Victoria. Perfect answer. Uh, we've never gotten that answer before, but I think that's a lovely one. I hope it helps the other guys. <laughs> We, we end each session with Good Bull, an opportunity to recognize someone else for something good or great they've done. Anyone that you would like to send Good Bull? Oh, yeah. I have to include everyone. <laughs> I'm dropping now. Uh, no one forgets somebody. Everybody right. knows I care and love and appreciate the support that I get from my network and my friends and my friends with Buddhism, my friends with professional music, and the music industry, family. So... I just have to say capital everyone. I mean, good bull to everyone. Even the ones that seem like they're a hassle, I somehow had there's some benefit in that, you know, some training of how to polish myself to have more compassion and understand people better. So big fat everyone on that one. I can't single out one particular good bull. They're all good bulls. There's so many. All good bulls. Shelly. Thanks so much for your time. I'm so happy. Like I want to, I want to sit here and talk for two more hours. Uh, we are, we are unfortunately at the end of our time. But uh, man, thank you so much for joining us. Well, Ben, it's really been a pleasure. You know, you're such a very, very uh, intuitive and focused interviewer. I, I do a lot of interviews, and I've really enjoyed our time together. If we can get together any other time. I hope that through the show, uh, our audience that's listening feels comfortable to reach me through email. It's on our website. Uh, and we're very accessible, just like we're supposed to be. I again want to thank you so much for the time and preparation and all that you've done, including me in this um, master, master podcast. Thank you so much. And for our listeners, we will have the website and Shelly's email in the show notes as well. So you're welcome to find it there. For our Mastercast top three takeaway, I wanted to talk about how Shelly met B.B. King. Not so much just because he met B.B. King, which is super cool, like cool levels that I can't even imagine achieving. But there were two things about that that really stuck out to me. One, that B.B. King stayed and waited for Shelly to come back (laughs) on multiple bus trips and waiting for the bus, that B.B. King stayed. He stayed because he knew it would inspire a young man who was working in a really hard industry. And then B.B. King told Shelley to stay with it. And I thought those were beautiful and important words, especially in an industry that's so hard, like the music industry or television industry or writing, you know, the, some of the things that you've done too, when it's that hard. It's easy to to maybe quit before you hit that stride of success. And I'm glad that Shelly didn't quit. Me too. Me too. I'm very glad that he didn't quit. And it seems like he's kind of found the life that he was meant to have. And for me, the life that I was meant to have was where I am now. And to be writing in such a way that I have plenty of time. No, well, I also didn't mean to say that you quit writing. That's not how I think of the way that you transition careers at all, just so that you know. I didn't take it that way. And I I, I didn't quit. But importantly, for me to continue doing that full time and having my career and my livelihood depend on timely output, that wasn't something that was going to work for me. And consistent output, that's just not something that would have worked well for me in the long term. You and the listeners have heard the story of the things that I observed toward the end of my time in LA and the idea that I was like, I can't build a life around this around doing this all the time every day. But the the place that writing occupies in my life now is perfect. Which I think is a great segue to the second point I would make from Shelly's episode or takeaway from Shelly's episode, which is create success in your own lane, that you've found a place where you can create great success in writing and in all the other things that you're doing that allow you to focus on the writing as much as you want to, or as much as works for you, kind of finding that perfect balance is really neat. And again, it's that yeah. that concept of creating success in your own lane. I think it's so tempting. I do it all the time. It's so tempting to think, I want to be like so-and-so. To me, it's so freeing. It's so freeing to say, I'm going to create the success that I can create, right? Do the thing that I can do well, or maybe the thing that only I can do. And I don't mean only in the whole world, but that only I can do 
this specific thing is really important and and maybe would take some stress off of us. <laughs> All of us on this call, Kyle Ackerman. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I I agree with that. And I think that to what you said about it, it being so tempting to emulate someone else, I think when you combine that with the discussions that we've had about failure and the discussions that we've had about living the questions rather than really being really being hungry to have the answers, especially right now, where that brings us to is a place of your life is a finding out. It is a finding out of what it is that you're actually capable of. And if you succeed in many of the things that you want, great. If you succeed in everything that you went after, maybe you weren't ambitious enough. And if you fail in everything that you went after, maybe you were aiming a little high. But the idea that there is that mix of success and failure is, I think, the proper way to shape life ambition for us. Yeah, I love that. Your life is a finding out. That's so beautiful. Yeah. I was thinking today, I was thinking today how hard it would even be to make a dog be silent. It's impossible to make this dog be silent. Thank you. (laughs) I'll leave that in. But what I was actually thinking today (laughs) was how I wish I had clipped my dog's toenails before this clip, this uh, recording (laughs) (laughs) was just how hard it would be to even imagine what life would look like in a few years. And I think you've said this before too. I am very goal oriented and I have this thing I'm trying to achieve normally. Right now, it's a little bit different. I have kind of a lot of things going on and work is really important to me, but I don't really have a clear next step of what the next thing at work would look like, which is kind of a first for me. And it is an interesting place of finding out, finding out what life might look like. And really what you said too about if we haven't failed some, we probably haven't taken enough risks. And I think I live a lot in fear, especially about money. And so I probably haven't taken some risks that I could have taken or maybe not even risks, but just tried some things. I And I do feel like I am doing a little bit of that now, but there's certainly is more opportunity to do that. I think it could be interesting. I'm glad you're finding out. For our last takeaway, I wanted to talk about, there's a saying that Shelly has on his website and on some of the flyers. I don't think he said it out loud in the episode, but the saying is creativity is more than a goal. It's a method of travel. And I thought that was a beautiful concept that creativity is the thing that could take us places or expose us to different people, different experiences, that it's really a mode of of experiencing things or of traveling was really beautiful. Yeah, and I definitely agree. An actress that I knew in Los Angeles said she had the best job in the world because she got to play pretend for a living and she got to inhabit someone else for a living. And that was, there was no better way of experiencing the breadth of what life has to offer. And that was something I had never considered. And I would never have wanted to be an actor. The challenges of that profession would not go well with me. But her way of experiencing life, that just, that that opened whole new doors for me, thinking about it that way. And the idea that it is, that creativity is a journey a method of travel, that those those kind of movement metaphors associated with creativity were certainly a new one on me. And mm. I'm grateful for having heard words like that. Yeah. Well, that's really cool. I imagine songwriting has a little bit of that in it too. Like the yeah. kind of playing pretend or being able to almost embody someone else in a way. Yeah. Yeah. And interestingly, the discussions that I host on Facebook are kind of the same thing. Mm. It, the whole point of common ground is to help you inhabit someone else's brain space, is to help you think like someone you disagree with mm. and come to understand this is a person. It's not some unnamed evil that is trying to subvert the country that I love. Mm. It's This is a person. I imagine even the graphic novels are like that for you too, right? The, the world creating that you're doing to convey something that's important to you, something that you need to say. I don't think Shelley said that today, but he I think he did say that. Either he or Wally, one of his friends who came on the, the YouTube discussion that was hosted last week by Richard Castleberry, 
who said, the important thing is, do you have something to say? Mm. And I think they, uh, someone asked about imposter syndrome. And he said, I don't really feel like an imposter because I have, I have something I need to say. Yeah. Or that's my interpretation of what he said. But it was neat to hear. Yeah. One of the big challenges with something like that, and so many creative people suffer from this, when you feel like you have said what you have to say really, really well, then figuring out, okay, do I want to keep talking? Yeah. What do I want to talk about next? Yeah. Um, do I do I still have something to say? Yeah, I can definitely understand that, especially the you know second album issues and yeah, even I imagine yeah. after success in a movie or a TV show, like what you say next is really important. So to your career, so how do you how do you do that? How do you say that? I imagine that can be the case for people who are kind of embarking on second careers or that second part of their career, and you know, in a business profession that it's. I think a lot of times about Bill Peel talking about the first mountain was about advancing himself and his career. And the second peak is really more about helping others. But I could imagine that second peak, you know, once you've had success in the business world, thinking about what you might want to do next could be challenging. I remember in um, Sydney Donnell's episode, she said some of the best advice she got was don't after you retire, don't commit to doing anything for six months because what you commit to next is important for how you're going to be spending your time in the future. Yeah. The process of saying no. Um, and that was a, a theme that showed up uh, here today. The idea of saying no to letting uh, the approval of the, of the audience define you mm-hmm. or define your art. That's so important. Mm-hmm. You have to keep it, it. Not that you don't appreciate your audience. Obviously, we appreciate our listeners, but we have to speak from here. And if we don't speak from here, then it doesn't matter how many people listen. Well, and I think also what something I'm learning from a leadership space, too, is if I spend all this time worried about what everybody thinks about me, I don't have the energy to do my job well. And I and then I will spend a lot of my time and energy thinking about do people like what I'm doing instead of doing what I do well. And I think that's been a good lesson for me in the last month or so of thinking about kind of just having more positive self-talk and not being so hard on myself to say, I'm going to make mistakes. I mean, I'm clearly not perfect, but I can either dwell on those mistakes or just continue to try to learn and grow and also embrace kind of who I am too in, in those moments. But do that in a way that's positive to myself. Like, okay, well, next time I could do it this way. It'd turn out better, but not negatively talking to myself. I think that's wise and I'm glad you're not you're not spending quite as much time trying to win the approval of people like me and Kyle because I've always I've always cared for you and Kyle never liked you anyway. That's right. <laughs> well, and I don't like either one of you, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I love you both. <laughs> love you too. You want to close us with a quote? I do. I I shifted gears on the quote for this episode. I had one picked out and then I realized that particular quote might, I don't know, might diminish what Shelley had to say in some way. So here goes. Conscious action is only the tip of the iceberg. 5% of reported actions are performed automatically below the surface of consciousness. We call these habits. We infer our values, beliefs, and personality traits from our past actions. Our identity is constructed from this unreliable historical record. What we did yesterday shapes who we think we are today. No habit occurs in a vacuum. Actions taken today alter the likelihood of all future actions. If I eat a cookie today, I become more likely to eat a cookie each time I find myself in a similar context. Every action feeds back into the system, echoing into eternity. Chris Sparks. Thanks, y'all. Thanks for listening. An MBA from Texas A&M University can take your career to a whole new level. With full-time and weekend options, Texas A&M suits your schedule. So get a better gig. Visit mba.tamu.edu. Looking to start a podcast? Trying to tackle questions like, how do I record? How do I edit? How can I get music for my show? What equipment do I need? How do I distribute it? Good news. The podcast architects are here to help. Whether that's from start to finish, fixing the audio quality, helping you get the episodes posted, go to podconsulting.co. Everyone has something worth sharing with the world.